What's up, everybody? Welcome back to U.S. History Class. Okay, today <clears throat> we're hitting part two in my Vietnam War lecture series. If you haven't viewed part one yet, I kind of lay the foundation for everything there. I'd recommend you go view them in order, uh, as that kind of makes sense to chronologically go through the lecture series. Uh, but if you have caught up on it, or if you don't mind viewing things out of order, here we go, continuing on with the Vietnam War. Now, where we had left off on the last lecture was kind of going over the Viet Minh, which M-I-N-H is the ending of that word. Uh, that was the independence group that was trying to break away from French colonial rule and kind of existed around the time of like World War II and shortly thereafter. Uh, then after the, the Japanese had come in and made it a colony during the war, and then the French get the colony back after the end of World War II, uh, that really kind of lights a fire under the independence movement in what was French Indochina, which Vietnam is a part of what that colony was. Um, they fight really hard. They resist. They see that as a time of opportunity since the French were, were quite weak uh, and still recovering from World War II. So Man, that's when they move. And really, uh, from what I know of it, uh, French Indochina was Cambodia, Laos, and modern-day Vietnam, those three countries. But I believe it was the Vietnamese people, which are distinct and separate from Cambodians and Laotians, that they were the ones that really took the lead on it. And Ho Chi Minh, who is the first guy I am going to cover here, he was the leader of the Viet Minh in that time. And he... Uh, is kind of an interesting figure. He is like a politician for sure. Uh, and he, I don't, even though he is a communist, uh, so I would definitely label that in there about him, that he is a communist leader, a communist politician, essentially, and kind of a military leader all wrapped in together. Um, I don't know that he was like that devout a fo follower of communism and communist ideals and principles. I think he viewed communism as a tool to help get independence for his country. Uh, now, I, I'm not an expert at him. I haven't read biographies on Ho Chi Minh. Uh, I know like a lot of times from the American perspective and guys that had served in the war. I mean, he is the arch enemy. He is the leader of the North Vietnamese uh, for a big chunk of the Vietnam War, but then dies before the American Vietnamese War uh, ends. Um, he was generally hated in America. We look at him, at him as a communist dictator. However, the people of Vietnam have a very different view of him uh, because they see him as a guy that helped helped lead them to their independence and get the, the colonial masters out of there. So I can definitely wrap my head around that if you wanted independence. And he's a guy uh, that had helped further that cause uh, in a lot of ways. And I put this in here in the third bullet point. I, the best thing I could compare him to in American history is I think he is kind of a George Washington-like figure in Vietnam. Now, that being said, I'm not so sure that this guy was quite as virtuous as maybe George Washington was. Uh, I do think he was kind of a ruthless and shrewd politician. He was not afraid to take out political opponents. Um, and, it, you know, he definitely pushed for uh, really... <clears throat> tough tactics, guerrilla warfare to basically any means necessary to accomplish his goals of breaking Vietnam away and like reunifying the country uh, because he was the essentially the leader, the dictator of North Vietnam when it splits and the South part of the country kind of wants to stay on Team America. The North part is going to side with the Chinese communists and the Soviet Union. Uh, but he wants, just like in Korea, similar situation, the Vietnamese are one people with one language, one culture. Uh, and I think one thing that most of the people in North and South Vietnam could agree on would be that they wanted their country to be unified, uh, but just each side, they couldn't agree on what kind of government to have. Well, he is backed by the communists. And I think a big part of that was he uh, is the leader up in the northern part, which is borders China. Uh, and it, by being communist, by saying, hey, I'm going to follow your political ideology, that uh, freed up a ton of equipment, supplies, money, and resources, because the North Vietnamese relied heavily on the Chinese to supply them militarily. Uh, now, again, I'm not sure how devout a communist he was, but definitely communist dictator of, uh, of uh, North Vietnam. Uh, generally, most Americans would have kind of a negative view of him. However, I think the other thing I wanted to sum up, 
it's very respected and kind of venerated within Vietnam. And even after he dies, while the war is going on, I believe it was in the late 1960s, although I don't have the exact date for you, um, he was still a figure they rallied around and they have statues of him. Uh, so kind of has that you know, larger than like George Washington type feel uh, th that we would think of in the United States. He's kind of that figure for Vietnamese people, right? So next up, now normally in class, uh, we would be doing a lot of map work and geography. Uh, I found it harder to do that stuff this year with the remote learning and, and posting things to Google, but I still wanna give you uh, the imagery and show you some maps. So here you go. Like if you follow my cursor up here, uh, where you see Dien Bien Phu, that was that battle we talked about where uh, the French kind of had their final defeat there and the, the Viet Minh scaled up the cliffs behind them and did a sneak attack. Uh, anyway, that, that's where that's at. Uh, the biggest cities now in Vietnam would be in the north, you have Hanoi, that is the capital of North Vietnam, and then down in the south, you have Saigon. So this is more like the American territory and where our guys would have been stationed when the war gets going. Uh, now, if you follow my cursor here, there's China, and they have it in red because it's a communist state. And then basically what was North Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, that was all called French Indochina. Uh, and when those countries are essentially released and the French empire gives up that territory, they break up into their separate countries because they all have their own language and kind of own cultures and customs. Uh, so here now Vietnam is this really long skinny country that kind of wraps around the coastline. Uh, roughly there at the 17th parallel is where the country, the political border between the North and South is going to be. So another similarity to the Korean War that we talked about, where remember, Korea is a peninsula, uh, a little bit larger than what Vietnam is, uh, but it was divided at the 38th parallel. And that was kind of the clear cut dividing line between the communist North and the the capitalist or the, the Republic so Southern uh, government. So some key points for you there. Just know that Vietnam is this long, skinny country here. I will show and probably use a few more maps as we go through and cover the war. And then another really key point that I want you to put in there is divides at the 17th parallel, which is one of those imaginary lines you'd see on the on the globe. Uh, and then also very key part, know that the north is the communist part. The south is like the, the pro-America part. Okay, now to sum up American involvement here, now we're gonna cover really kind of uh, from Lyndon Johnson and Nixon, that's gonna be where we'll focus on as we really start hitting uh, the Vietnam War and covering it a little bit more in depth because that's when most of the intense fighting happens. And that's where uh, of the, I think it was about 58,000 American soldiers that die in the conflict, most of those casualties would have been in the Lyndon Johnson and Nixon administrations. But I did want to emphasize how long this conflict drags on and give you this kind of quick summation and timeline. So we have five American presidents listed here. We have talked about Eisenhower. He is the old World War II general uh, that is a two-term president in the 1950s. Uh, Kennedy is the guy that's going to replace him. Actually, the first American presence is there under Eisenhower. So back in 1955, that's when the French regime is collapsing. The French are kind of huh, throwing in the towel and saying, we're getting out of here. We, we don't have the stomach for this fight anymore. Uh, that's after that Dien Bien Phu battle. And now Eisenhower, I think, was a little reluctant to just jump headfirst into a war. I mean, at that point, the Korean War had just wrapped up a few years earlier. Uh, However, he is firmly committed as a general uh, who becomes president to stop the spread of communism. He thinks the communists are a threat too. So as the French are kind of leaving, he sends in the first American like advisors and some military support. So a very small presence, military presence there, uh, but he's very much interested in preventing anybody and everybody in that region from going communist. Uh, so we find our allies down in the South. The North was kind of a communist stronghold. Uh, so American military advisors and some strategists go over there and they're trying to help out the South Vietnamese government that is interested in resisting communism. The first combat troops are sent in, and I believe it was 1963, under JFK. Now, 1963, at the very end of the year in November, that's when Kennedy is assassinated. Um, 
Kennedy sends in the first combat troops, but it didn't really heat up at that point. Uh, we're, again, we're kind of more in supporting roles, uh, but you could definitely see if you were in the know and watching what was happening that there was potential for this war to really heat up. Now, this is, I don't have ironclad evidence of this for you. Uh, however, though, I have heard I, numerous different times as I'm watching history documentaries or reading something uh, from this time period in history that apparently JFK had talked with his cabinet and was very concerned about the situation in Vietnam. Uh, the, there was a Southern uh, political leader there. Uh, President Diem had been assassinated. The situation was volatile, which absolutely true uh, with what was going on there and the reports he were getting, was getting were concerning to him. Um, I guess he was very reluctant to escalate that conflict. Uh, and he was having second thoughts about sending any troops over there, apparently. And uh, now this is kind of speculation. I don't have ironclad evidence, but apparently before he was assassinated in the weeks and months prior to that, he was considering move pulling all the american troops out of there if that had happened and this is the what if game like what if kennedy had not been assassinated there is a chance we wouldn't even be learning about the vietnam war at all in u.s history class because it might have never really happened it might have been a super small scale conflict and before it ever had a chance to heat up and escalate uh, he might have just squashed it and pulled it out and said it's not really worth the fight. Uh, because remember, Kennedy, with the, the Bay of Pigs, the Berlin crisis, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he very much wanted to uh, avoid escalating wars or potential like World War Three style conflicts. Um, so he was concerned about that. Who knows how it would have played out? Like uh, Kennedy's brother, who was the attorney general at the time, Bobby Kennedy, Years down the road, after Lyndon Johnson is president for a term, he becomes the most vocal critic of the, the Vietnam War in America. And actually, Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated in 1968, which we'll circle back to that and we'll talk about it down the road. Uh, but he was his platform was to push the civil rights movement and to end the Vietnam War. Then he gets assassinated. Uh, but the, things may have played out differently, too, if he had been elected, because the, the war had really heated up by 1968, but he was the candidate that was going to end the Vietnam War. That was what he was campaigning on. But of course, he doesn't get a chance to end up being president due to that assassination. So after Kennedy is assassinated in November of 63, Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes the president. Now, he finishes Kennedy's first term, basically about a year in office, and then he overwhelmingly wins re-election in 1964. Uh, so that's the first time he gets elected in his own right, because he had obviously finished Kennedy's term as vice president. Uh, as president, he... Lyndon Johnson does a lot of things that really impact the country. Um, and I'll try to get into a, as much of it as I can uh, before the end of the year. But kind of a controversial president. I think he had, for what it's worth, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, I think he had good intentions, but there were a, was a lot of collateral damage to many of the policies that he ushered in. Uh, one of the most glaring and obvious ones is he escalates the Vietnam War. And I underline that and put it in bold. Because that is totally, that's kind of a vocab term that applies to it. And it should be synonymous. It should totally tie into Lyndon Johnson. Uh, when things go bad and the, the war is not going great, his answer every time is send more troops over there. Send in another division. Let's, we're going to have to draft some more guys, get them over there. Uh, so the answer to all the woes and all the issues going on in Vietnam in his mind was, well, we just need overwhelming force. If we have more guys over there, it's more likely we'll have success. Um, it, in reality, I think we can look back at it now and say, that may have been kind of counterproductive. Uh, now, who knows if he had withdrawn everything, it probably the whole country would have gone communist anyway. But in the end, after 20 years or so of having a presence there, that is the final result. Uh, as soon as the American forces like evacuate and leave, the whole country does end up going communist. Uh, so spoiler alert there, I guess I just kind of uh, gave you the end of the Vietnam War, but I don't think of it like a movie or anything like that. Uh, so Lyndon Johnson, just no steady escalation. He constantly is sending more and more and more soldiers over there. Now, by the time 1968 comes around and he would be able to campaign for his second term in office, um, 
he has had it. Like he has become increasingly unpopular. Uh, the American public, it's kind of like was very supportive of the war to start. But then about 1968 to 1969 is kind of a tipping point where a lot of Americans are fed up with it. They've rethought this and they're really questioning why American boys are over there dying for some tropical jungle country that most people had never heard of prior to the conflict. Um, so he escalates the war. It also, at the same time he's escalating it, it becomes increasingly unpopular. It also gets far more bloody. Um, and it just kind of spirals out of control and becomes a, a pretty rotten conflict, I think, for, for Americans and for the Vietnamese people that were fighting in it. Uh, in 1968, Lyndon Johnson does not run again. That was when Bobby Kennedy was running for president, gets assassinated. When he dies, uh, that takes the wind out of the sails of, of the Democrats. And Nixon, who is the guy that had lost the JFK back in 1960, if you remember me talking about him, he runs for president again, and this time he gets it. Uh, Nixon now, he knows the war is pretty unpopular, but he's like, we, we've we're in this deep on it. We've invested tens of thousands of American lives and like billions of dollars. He's like, I want to find a, a way to have victory and leave with honor and to achieve our goals. But I also realize it's becoming unpopular. So he wanted to kind of gradually de-escalate the ground war. And his answer to everything was, we're going to use the Air Force. We're going to go in and bomb and, and take out the enemies with our better technology and air power. Now, that does not end up panning out real good. Uh, but the most bombing and the most, I think the highest casualties were actually during the Nixon administration, although he does try to start scaling back on the ground conflict. He had, he had promised to do that. He doesn't really fulfill that promise totally. Uh, we'll get into that in a little more detail down the road. Well, anyway, Nixon <clears throat> wins re-election in 1972. As he's starting his second term in office, the a scandal comes out, the Watergate scandal. If you've never heard about that, we definitely will cover that down the road a little bit. Uh, but a massive political scandal. He was kind of revealed to be doing some kind of corrupt stuff, and he has to resign in disgrace. So he's the only American president to ever do that. I'll get into the details of what politically went down there. Uh, but the war is still raging on. And then his vice president, Gerald Ford, who is actually the only president we've ever had it was from Michigan, a Michigan native. Uh, and he was a lineman at U for the U of M football team and stuff. A Michigan guy. He's buried in the state of Michigan. He uh, is the guy that is going to kind of oversee final withdrawal uh, of the Vietnam War. Uh, that probably unfairly a little bit tarnishes his reputation because I do think he, he does not win re-election in a, a term in his own right. Uh, but I think being tied to Richard Nixon and the whole Watergate scandal and being the president, that I think it kind of, he unfairly gets this rap, but that basically the, the Vietnam War is lost while he is commander in chief. Uh, that really was a lot of stuff stacked up against them, and he's not able to uh, win re-election. Now, uh, next thing here, what really is our excuse to go in and start hammering the North Vietnamese harder and really go in and try to prop up the, this government of South Vietnam that actually was not all that popular with the, the indigenous people, the South Vietnamese people, was something called the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, that is, if you go back and, and check out the map, the Gulf of Tonkin is kind of uh, right up by the northern part of Vietnam. Now, this is has been a conspiracy theory. Uh, and we talked about conspiracy theories that tied into the JFK assassination. Well, this is something that was a conspiracy theory for a long time. And then military documents have eventually been released. And we've come to find out this is a conspiracy theory that is true. So I would say it's really more of a conspiracy fact uh, at this point. Uh, but essentially what happened, what went down, and I'm giving you the really summed up version were exaggerated claims that some North Vietnamese gunboats came and attacked, I think it was an American destroyer, and started shooting at us. Uh, we used that to justify aggressive action back against the North Vietnamese. Now, our Navy is about a million times better than any kind of Navy that the North Vietnamese had. Uh, however, we still looked at it as if they're shooting at us, they're looking for a fight, we're going to use this 
And it was a fictional incident where we said they, they fired at an American ship. We use that as justification to get a resolution from Congress to go in and start punching back. Uh, now, the, the whole conspiracy part of it is that actually that was all kind of made up for political pur- purposes just to justify us going in and using more force and beating them up. Uh, so really, this whole war starts in, in really, or I should say doesn't start, but gets escalated based on a false premise that the North Vietnamese had attacked us when why on earth would they go out and try to attack our Navy with their tiny little boats? It doesn't really make sense uh, because our Navy was far superior and would clobber them. So I think they tried to avoid American ships as much as possible. Uh, but we use that as an incident to uh, to go in and Lyndon Johnson, I don't know how well aware he was if this was made up or not. Uh, I'm not really an expert on it, but he they use that. The U.S. government does under Lyndon Johnson to uh, is a justification to escalate the war. Now, last little part I have for you. Here's Lyndon Johnson as he's sitting with uh, President Diem. I believe this was back when he was still vice president. Uh, South Vietnam had been in kind of turmoil where, you know, we talked about Ho Chi Minh, who is very popular. He's actually popular in North Vietnam, but he was fairly popular in South Vietnam, too. Now. Your average Vietnamese person, if you go talk to them about communism versus capitalism, uh, dictatorships versus a republic, most of them, remember, they are very humble, poor rice farmers that in many ways are living like people would have lived probably a thousand years ago in that part of the world. Uh, So to go talk to your average South Vietnamese person and try to have an educated conversation with them about how communism is pretty dangerous and we don't really want a philosophy like that. We want more, you know, a representative government. They would have probably been scratching their head like, none of this really impacts or matters to my life. Um, So I think they just looked at Ho Chi Minh as he was a guy that helped them get their independence from the French. He wanted to kick out the foreign invaders. We know we kind of trust him, even if he whether he's communist or uh, he wants to get elected. He, he's a guy we like and back up, whereas uh, apparently the government in the southern part of Vietnam, even though it was a republic and they had elections, it sounds like there was a lot of corruption uh, and a lot of issues there. And it was not super popular or well liked so uh, by the Vietnamese people. So now you have a situation where by the time Johnson's in office, where You have this government in South Vietnam that the United States is propping up and trying to save from communism, but that the actual like indigenous people, the people that live there under this government didn't really like it or support it all that much. Uh, So kind of a messed up situation where we're like trying to do this on behalf of the, the Vietnamese people and hold this government up and keep it stable. But they didn't even really want the government all that particular government all that much to begin with. So uh, you can see how this war would start to trend in a very unpopular and kind of troubling way. All right, that's the end for part two. We'll be back again soon. And I got a lot of other cool stuff and and primary source uh, accounts of, honestly, some of it's some horrific things. uh, But I think it's very interesting and engaging to bring your way in the very near future. If you have any questions about this lecture, shoot me an email and I'll get back with you as soon as I